Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the Data Diversity webinar series, The Heart of Data Modeling, moderated by Karen Lopez. Today, Karen will be discussing normalization. It's not your friend or your enemy, joined with guest speaker, Carrie Tyler. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that join these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag HeartData. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. So for this particular webinar, it will go out by end of day Monday. Now let me introduce our speakers for today, guest speaker Carrie Tyler and primary webinar series speaker Karen Lopez. Carrie is a senior BI engineer with a consulting firm in Nashville, working with all layers of the Microsoft BI stack. He has over 10 years of various IT experience that helps him get through every day and every problem one way or another. Within the last year, he's begun presenting at SQL Server related events focusing on the analytical parts of the tool set. Karen Lopez is a senior project manager and architect at Info Advisors. She has 20 plus years experience in project and data management on large multi-project programs. Karen specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She is a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist. Karen is known for her fun and sometimes snarky observations on data and data management management. Mostly, she just wants everyone to love their data, and you can follow her at, at Data Chick on Twitter. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. How's your day going today? <laughs> it's going now that we've got everything running. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Shannon. You rock. So I want to thank all the attendees here today for joining us. Um, you know, Normalization is, is just one of those topics that um, just the sound of the word doesn't make me really happy. I don't like talking about it. I don't like teaching it. But there's so many myths out there, and it causes so much pain and suffering for um, both modelers and the people who have to consume our data models. Um, so it, it's kind of... Risky that we're talking about this topic on, I'm in uh, Southern California today on a beautiful day in Southern California, but I think that um, between what Carrie and I are going to talk about, um, one of the reasons why I invited Kate on uh, to talk with me today, besides the fact that he was in the room when I asked for volunteers and he probably just got, was the only person that coughed at the same time or something. Um, Carrie and I kind of have a, a unique background. We both speak in the SQL Server world at SQL Saturdays and conferences and things. But another interesting thing is, is that Carrie and I uh, graduated from the same program at Purdue, but let's just say a few years apart. Carrie, you know math. How many years apart? Oh, decades, right? A few. I see. <laughs> I hear three. Three? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, not that in itself that that's really important, but one of sort of the takeaways that I'd like for people to have about this is that, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit in a few slides about, you know, normalization, a brief overview, and where it started from was that every time I see an introductory class or a workshop or a single slide on a speaker's thing, you know, this was something that, that Ted Todd started to develop in, this, in 1970, so we can, you know, just barely the 70s, and yet here we are in 2015, all of those decades later, and it's still something that we're dealing with with relational databases, and a lot of the myths and misunderstandings and a lot of the important points are the same over the years, but I think that with the advent of NoSQL and with some other uh, non-relational technologies like XML, a lot of understanding of it's been lost. So we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, the other thing is, is that as Kerry says here on his slide, he used to fly little airplanes, but he also, um, you know, works in a BI sort of data warehousing ETL world. And there's often this sort of misunderstanding uh, about normalization in those worlds. So I wanted to make sure, because my work is primarily in transactional processing, that I had someone who could try to keep me honest about how normalized things need to be. Also, 
Sherry's going to be uh, watching the chat and the Q&A, and so uh, he might be interrupting me at times, and don't, and he's gotten permission to do that. Not very many people have that. So I've been doing this for a while, as Shannon said, and one of the reasons why I'm a fan of normalization is that I want everyone to love their data, and I can't wait to start talking about the things that people have told me about normalization. But let's get to know our audience, Kay. Who are you? And Shannon, that's your cue. Let's start the poll. Oh, and I won't be, Shannon, you'll have to talk us through it because I won't see it. Not a problem here. Let me, oh, let me take it. There we go. There we go. The poll is open. Oh, yeah, I get to ask, can I take the actual poll this time? <laughs> I do get to see it, actually. Who are you, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Everyone says, I want to choose all of them. So this is who you are, what your mama raised you to be, what you think in your heart, not necessarily what your number one job is right now. And then as people that are voting, um, Shannon, whenever shot button is good for me. Or will it be? Right. Okay. Yes. So the poll is closing in one second. <laughs> there okay. you go. Nice. But, yeah. <laughs> now it's compiling the data. Let me push it out here in just a second. I never know. All right. Be able to see the poll results now, everybody. It looks okay. like, yeah. Yeah, I can see it now. I, it looks like we've got, um, you know, some data modelers and some DWBI people, uh, about seven developers, uh, of 31 who said they're other architects or modelers. So it looks like I, there's more people who marked other than data modelers. So, that's really interesting. 23 people have said they don't fit in any of those categories, and or, sorry, 23 people, and 35 who chose not to answer maybe because they didn't like those things. So in the chat, you guys want to record, especially if you said the others, what you are, that would be really good too. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next poll, Shannon. All right, I am opening it now. There you go. So the question is, how do you personally feel about normalization? Do you think it's the best thing that ever happened to databases? It's a friend of yours, meh, or kill it with fire? And Karen, we had a um, comment come in that somebody, John is a data governance analyst. And it looks like a lot of people who marked other in data governance are data analysts. Oh, okay. Yeah, I sometimes put under data modeler, data analyst architect. Oh, I am seeing some of the chats as, as pop-ups. That's cool. So it looks like the poll closed. Yep, and it's doing its thing. Let me push it out here in mm -hmm. a second. Out in six seconds. <laughs> All right. There's the results. Really, only two people voted kill it with fire. So, 18 of you of the 140 think it's the best thing that's happened to databases. 51 think it's a good a friend of yours. 22 are like, yeah, either way. Um, and 47, you chose, how could you choose not to vote on how you feel about normalization? So, Shannon, go ahead and fire up the next one because it's going to look kind of familiar. Um, the reason I wanted to ask about this is that, you know, it's, it's important that we understand sort of, if we talk about friend or enemy, we need to know how people are feeling. So now the next poll that's open is, how do your teammates feel about normalization, either in your models or your database designs? And it's the same answers. 
best thing that happened all the way with kill it with fire. This one's kind of interesting for me and maybe some other people here too because it kind of depends on what your definition of teammates is. <laughs> yeah, how's that? So whether or not, for, for me, whether or not we're talking about my fellow BI people in directly on my team or on a larger project where I'm working with people from another vertical, maybe our SharePoint uh -huh. vertical or our .NET, you know, development side yeah. will dictate how they feel about that. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So when I think of teams, I, I usually tend to think of development teams. So the polls closed, so we can go ahead and push the results. Should be out there. Let me know if not. Okay. And Karen, we've got uh, there's a couple. Oops, it just went away. A couple questions from people commenting that. Uh, we've got a DBA that even fights all the time for having a surrogate primary key, and one comment on teammate, their teammates are developers and end users, and that's kind of an interesting yeah. angle to take that with end users. Cool. So um, we're going to talk about surrogate keys and normalization in a minute. So uh, people think that their teammates think that only 15 people said that they think their teammates think normalization is the best thing that ever happened. So I wonder if they're talking about people within their own groups, like other models, architects, and design database people, or in the more extended team. So 29, it's my friend, 42, or like, meh, and 12, so an extra 10 people that say kill it with fire. Okay, so that's the end of our poll, I think. Uh, about those things. Yeah, we've talked about those things. So what I want to talk about today, so now we've talked about who you guys are. So we have a good mix of people who are, who consider themselves data modelers, and we have only a few things, but, um, and we had some people who feel great about normalization and some people not so great about it. But why this topic? We'll talk about that in a second. And then why do people normalize, why are, why do databases need normalization or denormalization? Some myths and truths and some tips for some. But I have to make this great confession. So I've been data modeling for almost 30 years in database design. That's a really long time, almost as old as relational databases have been around, really about the same time. I never normalize. I'm going to explain that to you, though, in a minute. But that's my confession. I don't have the normal forms memorized, nor do I plan to. Yeah, like the first three, sure, those are easy. I don't care much about the nuances between fourth normal form and voice cod and whether or not there's really a sixth or seventh normal form or a tenth normal form. Um, my pro tip for you, though, is there's a trend. If you want to create your own dang normal form, you get to name it after yourself, just like planets or stars. You no longer have to name normal forms by their numbers. See, this is where Cod did that wrong. He did them by numbers. Instead of calling like TED1, TED2, he called it first normal form and second normal form. Um, I do believe, though, that the understanding of the principles of normalization is very important if you're doing design. Um, I don't believe normalization is a process. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And I, not everyone in the data world is going to agree with me on these things. So I would so love to hear your comments or see your comments in the chat about whether you agree or disagree with these, or on Twitter, at Heart Data. So why this topic and why not this topic? I would also point out I can never type the word normalization correctly the first time ever. That's part of my love-hate relationship with it. Um, and uh, so if any of those ended up on the slides, I apologize. One of the things about normalization, it's a love-hate thing. So I do a lot of data modeling training, which of course involves teaching people about normalization. 
And I love that I'm teaching people how to love their data and normalization is part of that. I hate the fact that I have to teach them how to do it. And we talk a little bit about how normalization is always taught wrong. So I teach, um, I, I work along with uh, Graham Simpson with his training materials on, that are derived from his book, Data Modeling Essentials, third edition. And the, he, he, Simpson and Witt's approach in their book and in their materials is to teach normalization first and then data modeling second. Uh, a lot of courses teach data modeling and normalization all kind of in the same thing. And I was really resistant to that initially. I um, really thought, I guess it's, again, that love-hate relationship I have with normalization is that I thought that focusing on normalization first was just drudgery and everything. And now that I've done this course quite a few times, I'm learned to appreciate the fact that getting people uh, who are new to modeling and databases to think in terms of good normal forms and why we do it first before we start teaching them about crow's feet and boxes and lines and dotted lines and all of those things is probably a good way to teach the fundamentals first. But the love-hate thing that I have with the word and teaching it and even having to think about the normal form is the rest of the world, people who don't wake up every day, like people like us who wake up every day thinking, I get to solve another data problem. I get to tell another data story. I get to create a new report or data visualization. Carrie, your job's like that, right? You get up every morning just ready to go fix another data problem? I at least get up that way. <laughs> Some days I get beat down, but I at least start out that way. Excellent. So I created this meme quite a few years ago, is that, you know, the part about normalization that everyone hates is it means in order to get your data back out of the database is that developers have to write queries that do join. And there's this whole mythological universe uh, someplace out there that I've never been to where somewhere people can make non-redundant database designs that are fully normalized, but you never have to do a join. And I have yet to figure that out. So I swore when I submitted this abstract to be our webinar for today, I would not actually talk about normalization. And then I realized I really have to. But this is not a how-to on normalization. I'm going to be very brief about these things. But I want to talk about why we do, why normalization is an important thing for modelers and database designers to understand. So Ted Codd, Dr. Codd invented this as part of his papers on the relational model to address update anomalies. I'm going to see a little bit about that in a second. But basically, and this is me paraphrasing it, that in a normalized relation, aka table, even though I know some people uh, don't like to use that as an equivalent term, but I live on a project where we design tables and we don't design relations. So I'm going to, from this point forward, I'm going to use database terminology to talk about normalization. And I realize how blasphemous that is and how wrong it is, but I'd rather it be more practical discussion than an academic one. So normalization gets you to a place where you have one fact in one place and then you reference that instead of duplicating it everywhere. That means that you have one fact, one time to create it, one place to update it, and one place or one item to delete for that. So in a quote, uh, this is from the Wikipedia article on normalization. And if you ever had spare time, you could Go so find all the data modeling and normalization entries on Wikipedia and see all the editing wars that happened in the back and forth between them. But what Dr. What Ted Codd said is that normalization was created to avoid undesirable insertion, update, and deletion dependencies. So the update anomalies is how people refer to it. And this, oddly enough, to reduce the need for restructuring the collection of relations as new types of data were introduced, thus increasing the lifespan of application programs. Now, this particular goal of normalization will be quite shocking to the people who 
tell us that relational databases are fixed schemas and you have to, and unable to change them, they're inflexible. You know, normalization was created to make schemas more flexible. If you think about it, you know, if you designed a data store that had just everything about an invoice all in one row in a data file. So you had the invoice header information, then a, you know, think about a common delimited text file with invoice header information, and then uh, all the invoice lines all repeated, all within that same row, and all the product information and the pricing information and the tax information. That was all in one really wide record. Then your application code would have to know how to parse that long row of everything. And so one of the things when Dr. Claude, when the relational model was designed, was that if we separate things out so that facts that are highly dependent upon the same identifier are kept together, we could add other sets of facts and link them up to everything without breaking everything we built before. That sounds pretty darn flexible to me. Um, the third point, make the relational model more informative to users. That's an interesting way to think about it. I think it's it goes to the fact that if you put data facts together that belong together, they're much easier to understand. So when you mix products and invoice dates and prices and office locations all in the same concept, that's harder to understand. The last part, which is really important part, and this gets to the heart of a lot of the SQL, SQL meaning relational and the non-relational parts of it, is that we design structures in the relational database that are neutral to the queries that are going to happen to them. Now, one of the reasons why we want to do that in a large enterprise complex system is that we rarely get the opportunity to design a database, uh, to design a database in that is only going to be used by one function or one application. We design enterprise databases normally that are going to be used by all kinds of queries, all kinds of applications. You know, take your customer entity or your customer table. We don't build a separate database. Well, we're not supposed to build a separate database or a separate table for every application. That is both a plus and a minus for relational systems or relational or, or enterprise relational architectures. The reason it's a plus is that we design these things in a way that makes them highly reusable, that aren't overly optimized for one query, because when we optimize a structure for one query, we automatically de-optimize it for every other query that would use it. That also means, though, that queries then have to do, the query and the database engine have to do a lot more work through the joins, through aggregating things, through uh, creating calculated data. It's a trade-off. So if you go by Karen's mantra of every design decision comes down to cost, benefit, and risk, you can see that we're trading off some costs and some benefits. Then we learned in the data warehouse world that we could design things that were optimized for certain sets of queries. We've also learned over the years in relational database that um, Sometimes we do end up designing structures that are optimized to certain queries. And the perfect example of that is why we create views and materialized views. We create those now either to simplify someone's understanding of the data or in the case of a materialized view, so data that has been pre-joined and pre-aggregated and pre-calculated so that we can pay the price one place and then derive all the benefits in, in many places. And I think that's why we came to realize that even in the relational database world, we needed a data warehouse or business intelligence model. So Carrie, this is where you work more on that side. Um, are all of your structures highly normalized? Due to, might be the, due to the specifics that I work on a lot, the answer is actually no, because um, my tools tend to feed, or my data models in lots of cases tend to feed into top-end OLAP systems, uh, the two flavors of, of Microsoft uh, SQL Server Analysis Services, for example. And those tools are made to consume star schemas 
uh, much better than anything else. So the, the, the final data models that I wind up with doing a lot of these days are actually pretty denormalized uh, because mm -hmm. that's what the reporting tools are work best at or work best with. And Right, and so even the, I mean, you, you said star schema or snow schema, whatever people are doing in their data warehouse world, I mean, we, it's a contentious issue. I know there are a lot of people who say they, they still want to put highly normalized structures, but this is a case where we, for usually for performance reasons, we've chosen not to have normalized data, and one of the reasons we can do that is because we rarely update the, the data in those structures. So the updating of the data typically happens in a transactional system, and then we move that data out, and now we've restructured it and denormalized it so that we can get the benefit. Is that how you see it? Yes, because uh, that's that's the great point is, is you design that to be read-only, and you can, uh, like the comments you made earlier about materialized views, you move the, you move the pain of inserting into that model to an off hours, you know, one time batch process. Right. Or even in the case of the NoSQL world, you know, a completely different system or right. that's trickle updated and not necessarily in batch or, and again, something that's optimized for read. So when the NoSQL people quite, quite correctly talk about how normalized models are so painful to query and don't perform. That's because they're thinking of a data story, a problem they're trying to solve, which is consuming data. And yet the relational model was created to solve a problem that existed long before that in network and hierarchical of data being inconsistent because it appeared in many places and therefore got updated out of context of other updates. So one of the things about normalization hey, is hey Karen, there it's all a about, oh, go ahead. Sorry, there was an interesting comment uh, or an interesting comment made in the Q&A uh, a few minutes ago uh, before we move on too far. Uh, Stacy mm -hmm. says, I like my logical data model to be normalized and then denormalize or genericize an abstract in my physical data model and ask for thoughts. Yeah, so that's really common. I mean, that is one of the reasons why we have, you know, these two separate levels of models of both logical and physical is our logical. I mean, I think logical models should be very normalized and because we're really, I think the role of the logical model is to store the specifications about data, our decisions about data, and the physical model is about building something that has leveraged off that model, but we're building it and we're trying to optimize it for um, either a specific application or a specific tool set. Um, I mean, that is the reason why we have the two sets of models. I will throw in, though, that most data modeling tools, I'm trying to be polite here, most data modeling tools uh, are very cumbersome about having logical and physical structures of the same thing that are in highly different structures. So the more the, the greater the difference between your logical and physical, the harder it is to maintain that. Um, sometimes people just don't even keep track of the linkages and they just have a completely logical model and a completely physical model. Um, the modeling tools have gotten better at that, but it's still a difficult thing to do. So great comment, great question. So normalization. When you go read the rules about normalization, it's all about the keys or the identifiers, to use the more correct term. Um, and yet people don't think of them that way. So every question you have about the normal form talks about the keys. And it depends on the meaning of the keys and columns. So I have people tell me all the time, oh, you can just, you know, you can just use a script to normalize all your data. I don't know how the script knows the meaning of department name versus department description versus uh, facility description. I don't know how a script would know that. And one of the problems that we have when we use surrogate keys is your normalization stuff goes all to heck. And when I talk about the normal forms, I'll talk about that again. Um, and it depends, normalization questions or rules depend on the makeup of the parts of your keys, in other words, the columns. So here's briefly, and I still didn't want to have this slide, but so briefly, 
um, sort of a description of first, second, and third normal form. So in first normal form, all the instances, C or rows, have the same facts, columns, and a table. Um, and there are no, so all the instances of an entity have the same facts, and there are no repeating duplicate columns. Um, so typically called no repeating groups. That just means that you would never, uh, sorry, uh, first normal form means you wouldn't have, you know, a table called person and then a bunch of columns for child, 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 child to keep track of all the children that that person is related to. And in one article I read, they said this is kind of just implied because Relation, relational model has no concept of repeating groups, and therefore all the normal forms would have this rule. Second normal form only applies to multi-part keys that no fact, no non-key fact in your relation is about just part of the primary key. So you're looking at dependencies. So when I say is about, I mean something like the difference between department ID and department name. So if you have department ID, department ID is your primary key, department name would be the non-key fact, and in theory, it's dependent upon department ID. Third normal is no, de, no fact depends on another non-key column or fact. So that tells you about these dependencies, and the, the dependencies, the word dependent, dependency comes up a lot in normalization descriptions, is that it's talking about in order to identify one from another one. And most of the normalization problems that I see in designs that I review are because someone has thrown a surrogate key on a table, so a GUID or identity or something like that, a sequence. And now these questions just go away and it makes it so easy because if you think your primary key is one, two, three, four, five, then you're either breaking all these rules or meeting all these rules because your one, two, three, four, five means nothing. So an important takeaway, especially as you're dealing with your teammates, is to understand applying surrogate keys really early in your process means that it, you're going to make more normalization mistakes and the normalization issues that you have are not going to be apparent. This is why, well, I use surrogate keys a lot, I apply them as late as possible as I can in the process of doing a design because it clouds all these questions. Is department name dependent on 12345? I don't know because 12345 is just a row identifier that someone slapped on this table. I have to go find the alternate key or one of the candidate keys in order to answer these questions. So Ted Codd. The, the, the statement we make about all the way through to third normal form is um, every fact is either part of the key or depends upon the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key, and then people throw on so help you pod, uh, just to remind you of taking an oath. And our friend Michael J. Swart, who's also in the SQL Server world, he does lots of these comics about data stuff. And this is one of my favorites where he says, Ted Codd hates that thing you just did. And I'm known, I've been known to put those in a slide deck just when I'm doing a model review. But this is a good way of remembering first, second, third normal form. Depends upon the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. Graham Simpson, who was the previous host of a webinar series at uh, State Diversity in his uh, Data Modeling Essential says normalization is like marriage. You always end up with more relations, so more tables. So this is one of the reasons why people really hate to think about normalization, is they will tell me, there's too many tables. So my answer back to them is always, well, how many tables should there be? Like, if you can make a scientific conclusion that there are too many tables in this design, then you obviously have an answer of what's enough. Another related question to this, and I see this in a lot of blogs, is that there's some number of joins. So the number I've seen is anywhere from five to seven. If your query has to join more than five tables, then your database design is wrong. And I'm here to tell you that kind of generalization has no business 
in the data modeling or database design world. And anyone who says things like that needs to find a way of saying, hey, why do we have so many joins? Do we need all this data in our query? Is there, what is the reason the data is all spread out on all these joins? That's the question to be asking. And yes, a 17 join query is going to be ugly. But I would say it's rare in the transactional world that we actually need to have a 17 table query in order to perform a transaction. Sounds to me like someone's trying to do some reporting or some ad hoc queries on our transactional system. And as we've spoken before, we think there's probably a better place to do that. So Carrie, when you guys are moving, getting data out of a, a source system and getting it ready for ETL, how many is too many joins for that? How many, that is, how many is too many? Yeah. Not as a rule, but where do you start I, getting scared? I don't, I, um, I don't know that there's a hard number. It depends on how big the tables are and what the lookups look like, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, it's the, old, it's the old SQL Server DBA answer, it depends. Uh, like yeah. if there's, you know, if the if the PKs are 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 all or a lot of GUIDs or something, I say GUIDs instead of GUID because I'm weird. Um, okay. Uh, if if the, if they're all GUIDs, then it's not going to take very many for me to get nervous about how that query is going to perform. But uh, to to some extent, it goes back to a point I made earlier, which is uh, since since this is probably happening in an off uh, in an off hours batch type situation. Even if performance is kind of rough, I'm probably not going to worry about it too much. Or what I'll do is I'll do it in chunks and use multi-layered, multi-layered staging, air quotes, yeah. staging tables, you know, to build up what I really need. You know, if it's a really wide fact table, for example, that's coming from right. that uh, are is pulling data from a whole arm load of source tables. Yeah, but but a five table join it doesn't make the boys cry, does it? No, not five. Five, five is nothing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And yet I hear five is too much for a query. So I've had people one of the say reasons, that before. Yeah, in blogs too. So one of the things that I mentioned, when people start sprouting these rules to me from normalization myths, is I remind them that enterprise applications are really complex. I mean, that model in the lower left there, that's 800 and some tables. My data. Now, not every query is going to hit every table, but there's just all kinds of queries. And I try to tell people, get over the fact that you have to do joins, get over those things, and there are things that we can do to help tune a poorly performing query. Sometimes that's denormalization, and sometimes it's not. So when I talk about what normalization isn't, so my favorite quote from a conference once was that normalization was created to slow down the read and write heads on spinning disks so that they didn't crash. And I thought that was the silliest explanation of normalization. And someone said that in a presentation, and I thought they were joking, and I laughed out loud, and then no one else did. The thing is, there's so many myths about them. You know, this thing about if you have to do more than five joins and your database design is wrong, um, that, you know, normal, you have to take everything through first normal form, second normal form, third, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. What normalization is, we had earlier in the deck, it's a design philosophy to minimize, update, delete, and create fa fails so that we have consistent data. It is a data quality thing. And if I had time to demo this, it's also a performance tuning thing. So think about if you had a table that had 10 million rows, and it was, a, let's say, a million rows, and it's a transactional table, and you had a bunch of repeated information, you've now artificially made that table very much bigger. The indexes are bigger. Its storage space is bigger. The, the, yes, it's just like how white QWERTY was invented. That's how people think of normalization. If you have this big table, meaning lots of rows, and it wasn't normalized, and you had to do an update, instead of updating the data in one place, you probably end up having to update it in several places, that hits 
but that's a trade-off on update performance. Now, most of the time, we focus on query performance. We don't focus a lot as much on insert and update performance, but there are some workloads, some data stories where we do. Why people hate normalization? Well, because they think normalization is the opposite of performance. Our cases where normalization improves performance because you're storing one fact in one place and therefore that makes your database smaller and your table, table smaller. Mostly it's taught wrong, which I'm going to talk about. For the most part, it's misunderstood. And then the last thing, heaven forbid, it's not sexy. So someone should tweet that. Um, I agree. Normalization is not sexy. I wish we didn't have to talk about it. Uh, I wish that um, we can teach people data modeling, and I have done this before, teach people, people data modeling without mentioning the word once. Why is it taught wrong, or how is it taught wrong? Every course that I've ever seen, or every presentation I've attended on it, people teach it as a process, and I think because they learned it taught as a process. And what I mean is they say, well, first our data is in zero normal form, then we put it in first normal form by removing all the repeating groups, then we put it in second normal form by looking at composite keys and making sure that all the non fact columns are dependent upon the whole key. And then in third normal form, we take out any columns and move them to another table when it's dependent by other, another non-key thing. Well, guess what? In the real world, I don't know about you guys, I have never done a data model or a database design that way. I start with a, fact, a, a collection of facts. I start with entities, and I think, what are the facts that I need to know about that entity? Oh, well, I need to know the customer's names, and I need to know um, some information about dependents, and I need, and the first thing I'm thinking of, well, a dependent isn't the customer, so I'll go create another table. I never, you know, created this first normal form data model. I think we do ourselves a huge disservice by teaching data modeling and database design in this way, and I'm on kind of, I just want people to understand the concepts and then never speak it again. So when I said at the beginning that I never normalize anything, this is what I mean. I do not take things through first, second, third normal form all the way through. I just model things based on their meanings and these dependency questions. So if I have an entity called um, organizational, or if I have an entity called facility, and then I need to keep track of who the manager of that facility is, I don't put, you know, Jane Doe is on the facility table. I auto automatically know that Jane Doe isn't a facility, and therefore she's probably got another primary key, and I make sure Jane Doe's information is accounted for in some other table, either employee or worker or person. So, Karen, People as, use, uh, yeah, go ahead. As, as, someone who, as someone who didn't learn modeling in class, let's say, I did have one, but whatever, um, how much of that behavior, so I do the same thing basically, but how much of that behavior is because you know what you're doing versus, versus uh, you know, and, and, and by that I mean yeah. are intimately familiar with the whole concept versus, versus just getting taught or just getting started. Yeah, so there is a little bit of that. You know, I tell people I data model by now instinct, intuition, and just having modeled the same thing a hundred times before. There's that. But I've actually seen on projects where people force you to produce a first normal form model or table and then a second normal form. And for me, that, that's the part that I don't agree with. So usually what happens is you model something and then you look at it and you say, oh, you know what, that phone number that we put on customer doesn't go there, it goes over on this other table called contact mechanism, you know, and so we're, we're normalizing out sort of the misses, you know, having put things in the wrong place because we misunderstood it or didn't realize that there were many of them, like phone numbers or email addresses, that I get. But I also think that people think normalization is bad because they think you have to, you know, first do normal form, then second, then third. It's not a process. Um, people use normalization as a grade. Oh, a fourth normal form, that's a better model. A uh, third normal form is the magic. So I keep hearing this all the time. Our models are all third normal form. Well, I hate to tell you this, your model doesn't have a formal normal form at all. Your database doesn't have a normal form. 
only table slash relations have a normal form. Now, just talk about primary key. It is not, you know, the same table. You could create a simple code table, and because it has a single value primary key and a name and a description, it's automatically in all the normal forms, or it could be. So I, ha I see these standards all the time. We will not go beyond third normal form. Well, I hate to tell you this, but the higher normal forms, which aren't grades, if you don't have a multi-part primary key, you're probably in a higher normal form than third. So people treat a normal forms like a grade. It's not. It's a measurement. It's like saying, you know, we're going to set the temperature in our refrigerator to minus 49 because that's better than 40 degrees. It's not. It's just a measurement. So normalization, not a, yeah, go ahead. There's a comment here that kind of fits it, or it kind of goes along that along those lines. And Max, Max asked, "Isn't the he asked, isn't the uh, Boyce-Cobb normal form the magical?" And I assume, I'm I'm guessing he means the the end goal place to go. But there's more beyond that. Did you know that? There's like more. And and so when I say there's a magical one, I, I just keep hearing you know third normal form. We're not going to go beyond that. Um, and I used to have a project manager. Every time I'd open the model, he'd say, that's not in third normal form. Our standard's third normal form. And I'm like, I don't know how to break this table to bring it back to third normal form, because I can. Um, so because it's taught this way, people think it's the process you're going to draw them through, and I'm going to have some tips about that. I'm sure. Um, I also think that, uh, yeah, it's like grade. It's like any other thing with a number. People see the number as a grade. Um, some of the other reasons why people hate uh, data modelers or people who want normalized forms is that because there's so many misunderstandings and because sometimes we modelers talk in terms of it's important because it's not in third normal form. We do ourselves, in this, uh, do ourselves more harm by ourselves talking about normalization, first of all, in front of users. No user cares what normal form their database uh, objects are in. Uh, I think we shouldn't really care because in theory, uh, so if we're doing a logical model, so a whole, a whole other set of rules for logical models. Um, if we're doing a logical model, I do strive to engineer out all the dependencies, even the higher normal form dependencies. I want one fact in one place in my logical model so that I don't have inconsistent definitions or data types, um, so that I know for sure that there can be many of those and not just one. So I'll just keep using email address as an example. I'd say the vast majority of database designs and data models out there have, um, you know, just a single email address for a customer or a person or employee, and we know in the real world there are multiple ones. Um, do we put those in another table? Well, we should. If a customer has multiple email addresses, there's probably a reason, and we might want to keep track of that. But I also think that um, sometimes it's okay, though, to entertain fee normalization. So coming back to email address, let's say your business is interested in keeping track of multiple email addresses for a customer. My guess is the business really, unless you're in collections or uh, forensics or something in security, my guess is your business might come back and say, yeah, let's keep track of three email addresses, just because we want to make sure we can reach them if we need to. You know what? That might be the perfect time to sully your data model and your database design and just put three columns in. And why would you do that? Well, performance. Second is that um, chances are the business isn't going to come after telling you to go from one to three, come back and say now go to 14. I mean, they could because every design decision comes down to cost, benefit, and risk. So when you denormalize, you're taking a risk that you understand the nature of the data and what the trade-offs trade -offs are, actually are. Um, but that might be one great example. And in fact, we kind of do that already with things like address line one, address line two, address line three, address line four. I mean, 
that sounds like a repeating group, doesn't it? And yet we see that design all the time in our models. Christine data modelers just refusing to denormalize some things that could pay a big benefit and have a relatively low risk. So some of the tips that I wanted to go through is I think we should just stop talking about first, second, third normal form unless we're trying to deal with a really tricky problem, unless the data, the accuracy of the data is so important that we need to understand sort of the underlying uh, mathematics underlying our data to ask those questions. What's it dependent upon? Is it dependent upon anything else? Do we have the right primary key for what we're talking about? So I'd like to see us, even though now I've just done a whole webinar on normalization, to not just talk about it much, learn it and use it and understand it. So I think you should know the normal form and know the lingo, just don't use it as much. Um, I think it's much more important if you're having sort of a data modeling or database design debate to be able to explain the anomaly that you're trying to avoid. So instead of saying, well, that's in first normal form, don't say that, is say, well, you have these three columns of, um, you know, you have these three columns, but they're really the same thing just repeated. Um, and what happens when we, instead of having three of them, we now need seven of them? How are we going to do that? Or you put all this nice information in the next sim, and I think the reason you've done that is just to avoid having to create a new table and do a join. Maybe we should do that and consider performance. Um, I said that normalization is all about the keys, but most primary keys in databases are now meaningless surrogate keys, and it makes it really hard. So that means you need to understand the alternate keys, which are usually business keys, to understand what that entity is, and therefore you could decide which attribute belongs to that entity. Um, if you have a primary key that's a surrogate key and you have not identified an alternate key through a constraint on that table, and 99.9% .9 of the time, there will be an alternate key that you should be enforcing. Then you don't know if your tables are normalized or not. So that means primary and alternate keys and foreign keys should be enforced. I, I was going to say there, if you don't enforce your alternate key, you don't have an alternate key. <laughs> that is true. And oh, I should, people have to remind me. So alternate key is not a database term. It's a uh, relational term and it just means it usually means what could have been a key, um, usually a business key, and it's enforced through a uniqueness constraint and may be made up of many columns. Uh, I think it's also important for data modelers to understand denormalization patterns. So what sorts of things, if we do have to denormalize for performance, make the most sense? So I gave an example of a repeating group, even though that kills first normal form, you'd think that just broke everything, but this is the most common denormalization I do. And it is a risky move, but sometimes it has huge payoffs, and it has sufficient payoffs that um, the end users and the teammates are willing to take this risk knowing that we've transformed risk into a performance gain. Um, I get these requests all the time in our change management system of, they're joined, this needs to be denormalized. And I flip those back to the people and saying, tell me the denormalization you're proposing. Um, you know, I wanted someone to collapse about 12 tables down sort of header detail, detail, detail. So one to many, one to many, one to many. You wanted me to collapse all those into one table, which of course would have meant many, many repeating groups of repeating groups. Um, but in the change request system, it was like, there's too many joins, this needs to be denormalized. And everyone was like, yeah, great, do that. And I said, no, I need to see his design to understand what he wants. And he kept pushing back on that, and finally when he did it, everyone said, no, that's crazy, we're not doing that. So need to be denormalized is not a requirement. It is a suggestion of how to attack a problem at a very high level, which does not belong in a change management system uh, or in a change request. That means that in order to provide a good uh, response to this needs to be denormalized, 
is that we modelers and designers need to understand what other performance tuning techniques could be done to solve problems. Denormalization is not the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or all the way up to tenth thing that I would look at if I were tuning a query. Um, so when uh, people on my teams understand that now, um, I try to squash all joins are evil discussions, um, unless we're doing a nice meme about them, uh, because joins are a feature in a relational model in a transactional design, not so much in a B, uh, data warehouse or BI design, they're a feature. They are what keep us, keep our CIOs from going to jail, that gain us new customers, that ensure confidence in IT and business, and this whole stump speech I can do about why joins are wonderful. And I think that we all need to do those too. Now having said all of this, we modelers are not known for being flexible about wanting to sully our data models, our physical data models. That's why we have people as architects and modelers is that we can respond to uh, normalization trade-offs in a way because we can look at cost, benefit, and risk. So are there any other questions or chat items, Carrie, as we get near the end? Karen, one thing was said in chat that, uh, as soon as I find it again, was, was I thought was a good question, and I know it's right up your alley as well. Um, mm -hmm. ah, Ayana asked, is there a suggested normalization approach that supports easier data governance? <laughs> wow, I'm not even sure I totally understand that question. Um, are we talking about methods? So if I told you to strike normalization from our conversations, yeah, Karen, uh, then Karen, I'd, Karen, yeah? she adds, I meant from a technical metadata modeling perspective. Okay. Um, I, I think the thing is, is that this is, normalization is about data integrity, data quality. That's why we're engineering out update anomalies, create, delete, and update anomalies. So wherever data quality fits into a data governance process, that's where normalization fits. Um, but I think if we do this sort of natural form of data modeling that I talk about, where the end result is a certain level of normalization, that those are the things that fit in. So from a data governance process, I as a modeler or data architect, I review and approve the design, the models and the design. Sometimes I create them myself, which makes it really hard to, really easy to review and approve them, and sometimes difficult. Um, that we know that when people design tables and their job responsibility isn't to ensure data quality, they tend to design highly denormalized, optimized for the query, you know, the exact opposite of what Cod said. Um, and that makes their queries go blazing fast, and then it also makes the data very much unloved and poor quality. But I know that performance and data quality are a trade-off. I'm always going to lean towards data quality and protecting the data, and sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. So I know that's a big it depends answer, but that really is the only answer I can give for that. Um, so that's all I had to talk about normalization. I would so love to hear what other myths that you have heard. Uh, oh, one of the statements that I, I also quash, and this gets uh, bandied about all the time in the SQL world, is the right way to do normalization is normalize till it hurts and denormalize till it works. And that's so factually incorrect because it focuses on the process and it implies that normalization is painful and that denormalization feels wonderful. All of that's wrong. So I'd love to see either in tweets or feedback or you can email me or email Shannon and any of these sort of uh, sayings that people have heard because I'd like to blog about that. But I wanted to thank you all for a great conversation. Thank you so much, Carrie. This was so much easier for me and you brought the right level of snark and assistance. I wasn't even I wasn't even trying that hard on the snark, honestly. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> you know why I invited you. <laughs> right. Okay, Shannon, it's back to you. 
Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Terry, for joining us this month, and thanks, as always, to our attendees who are so engaged in everything we do. I love just watching the chats through the whole process and the questions coming in. Just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session, and uh, probably a copy of the chat going on since it was so uh, on fire this time. And I hope everyone has a great day. I will stop the recording here, Karen, for you.